all this inflation stuff people are dealing with right now. And this is what a lot of small businesses are dealing with right this very second. Constantly looking at expenses and trying to button them up and they didn't anticipate 50% increase in some material they use on a regular basis. And Sally left and she was $40,000 a year and they can't replace her. The only one that they can replace her with now is $75,000 a year. Right up to the day when something's due, $5,000 here, 10 grand there. The next thing you know, that 30 days of, that, of cash flow that most businesses have it is gone. Let me tell you a story. So I know uh, quite a few financial advisors. We do similar things in that, you know, they might do 401ks. I do the other side of employee benefits, medical, dental, vision, life insurance, and disability. There's lots of reasons why financial advisors and benefit brokers like to connect and create relationships. And this particular financial advisor, I've really enjoyed our relationship and uh, she's absolutely wonderful. She's owned, you know, she's an entrepreneur at heart and we find ourselves chit-chatting probably about once a week and I've really enjoyed those uh, chats and I highly recommend to anyone out there to definitely find your tribe, find your I know that in sales meetings and sales training, they tell you to find centers of influence that will refer you business. And although getting business is great and wonderful, and I certainly always appreciate it, it's probably the highest, I look at it as the biggest compliment when someone I respect trusts me enough and values my opinion enough to refer me business. I mean, I'm getting chills right now. It's just, I can't tell you how grateful I am when those situations arise and that I really see it as the one of the highest levels of uh, compliment I can receive. A client testimonial is also, um, I would call it, it's um, gratitude and inspired and gives me juice. It's this fuel to continue to work hard and continue continue to do what's best for my clients and do what's best for my referral partners or my centers of influence which I don't even really like those terms because a lot of these people over the years have become my friends and I see that as just as important as the, and more important actually, than the ability for them to refer me business, because really anybody could, at the end of the day, could refer me business. My mom <laughs> could recommend me, um, my friends, you know, people come across people that need help with their insurance all the time. And although I believe centers of influence are very, the concept is really good. I haven't found my tribe of centers of influence by seeking centers of influence. When I was younger and I tried to align myself with other centers of influence, and I know this works for some people, I'm just saying what worked for me is when I chased the off authentic relationship with another person when I was truly curious about what they did and why and put getting to know the person first and genuinely and <laughs> genuinely cared about it I built the relationship versus younger me was more selfishly focused and trying to find people that would refer me business and that was the first thought that always came to my head can this person refer me business or is this person a potential client? And I am, it's this just the hard headedness in me, I guess, that that was, I'm like, that's why we're here. We're doing business. Like we need referrals. Like, you know, uh, if anything's outside of that, it's wasting my time. And now I've learned that 
I learned just as much as a fellow business person connecting with these people. And even if I don't end up getting a referral from them, I still gain so much from the relationship, just being able to um, exchange thoughts and be around them and get advice, free advice from them and be in a relationship with them where I can call and candidly chat with them about something that's on my mind. Even if it's just venting and saying like, hey, this is what's going on today. I know it's all going to be fine at the end of it, but let me just tell you what's going on. And then sure enough, they tell me something that's going on and it's like a counseling session with a counselor that understands business. So recently I had one of these financial advisors come to me and she said, you know, we've been chatting a lot and I keep coming up against this challenge with this client. They're having cash flow issues. And because I value the relationship, I'm not going to pressure anybody. I'm especially, you know, I am not a high pressure salesperson. I'm just not, it's never been my style. I will continue to follow up and I will, if, if I feel that it's the appropriate thing to do, I have come across clients that do need the pushiness, <laughs> the email and the phone call and the hey, I need this by X date, otherwise we're going to miss our deadlines. And when I am that way, I make sure that it's aligned with the best goal for the client and the goal that's been communicated thoroughly with the client or the prospect. So it's not that I'm not tenacious and it's not that I'm lazy or don't want to follow up with people. It's that I, I will continue to follow up if it doesn't make sense. Um, if I'm like, hey, I can save you, you know, I'm seeing I can save you $50,000 and you're not getting back to me, like, what's up? Like, 99% <laughs> of people will see the savings in that, especially for a small business, and follow up um, pretty quickly <laughs> if there's dollars behind, like, in that amount. Um, some reasons why I've seen people not want to move forward with that type of savings is sometimes, you know, if it's a larger amount of premium, you know, if the carry if the client's paying over a million dollars a year in premium and you can save them fifty thousand dollars and you're not working directly with someone in finance or one of the owners, it may be seen as just additional work. And there is an associated cost with additional work for an HR and an admin team, and that has to be, their time is valuable as well, and that has to be taken into consideration. However, I have seen it where maybe it's $100,000, you know, it's more like 10% of a million dollar premium. I'm not getting any traction. Um, it usually has to do with the relationship with the other agent and broker as well as the admin team not wanting to do the additional work to make the change. Um, so those things do come up, but very rarely um, it is where you can make a significant amount of savings. You do have one of the owners involved and they see in, and in the smaller, so this is in a smaller, this is a smaller referral. They did not have a million dollars in premium or anything like that. Um, it was a smaller business and they needed help. The cash flow issue, you know, right up to the day when something's due, they're waiting for bills to come in and they need that additional 30 days of cash in the bank to have that cash flow freed up. And this financial advisor was looking at that and one of the ways to improve cash flow is to cut some costs somewhere. So she had been over and over and over with this with the client and was constantly looking at expenses and trying to button them up. And as soon as she'd button up one area, another area would get an increase, right? Like all this inflation stuff people are dealing with right now. And this is what a lot of small businesses are dealing with right this very second. 
you know, they cut a cost somewhere, cash flow, you know, they didn't anticipate 50% increase in some material they use on a regular basis. And, or they had Sally left and she was $40,000 a year and they can't replace her. The only one that they can replace her with now is $75,000 a year. You know, $25,000 here, 10 grand there, you know, it really adds up. And next thing you know, that 30 days of, that, of cash flow that most businesses have it, is gone. So this client was in that sort of a situation. They came to me or their advisor came to me and said, hey, I know the group's small. I want to say there were like 15 employees. And she's like, you know what? I've had five different brokers look at this. Uh, you know, I'd be shocked if there's anything you can do. But if there's absolutely anything, she knows I do some, even with smaller groups, some creative things like HRAs, partial self-funding, level funding. I, we absolutely look at everything. And even if it doesn't make sense, it's something that I see as a great educational opportunity for the financial advisors I work with, as well as the client, you know, just letting them know this is how some people finance their insurance basically is what it is. Um, and if you're not comfortable with it, that's fine. It might not be the year for you, but three years down the road, after me talking about this with you for three years, you might say, Hey, you know what? Now's the time we're willing to go down that route you know, to ma maintain this level of benefit. And we feel comfortable with it because a level of comfort is education and repetitive education and getting familiar. Familiarity creates a sense of security and comfort. And I understand that. So that's a reason why I go over that with, with clients and prospective clients. So we did all that with this client. We looked at everything. And I, at the end of the day, was able to find an association that would take them on. And they were able to get into an association and save $50,000. Um, really, really cool story and something that made the financial advisor very, very happy being able to come with an annual savings of 50,000 for a small business of about 12 employees. That's a ton. That's a lot. And they were also able to improve their benefits and lock in a fixed rate per person per plan type. So in smaller groups, they usually have a different rate for every single employee. So Sally, who's 35, is going to have a different rate than Johnny, who's 34. You know, every a 25-year-old has a different rate than a 26 and 27 and 28. It used to be age bracket. So it used to be, gosh, let's see if I can remember. <laughs> Um, I believe it was up to age 25 or something, zero to 25 or zero to 18 was some rate, I think zero to 24 and then 25 to 34 was a rate and then 35 to 44 and then 45 to 50, 50 to 55, you know, basically. And then it broke down into every five years and it would be a set rate for that age group that age bracket for employee, employee spouse, employee child and children and family. So it was a fixed rate for family. Well, now after 2010, um, it is a rate for every single person on the plan because that's what ACA stated that these insurance companies had to do. So not only is there a different rate for a 30 year old, 31, 32, 33, 34, for the employee, there is also a different rate for each and every family member. So if they have three kids, they're going to get charged a rate for every single kid. If they have a spouse that's older than them, their spousal rate is going to be higher than the employee rate. And that all added together is their family rate. Where before it was just a standard cumulative rate. It didn't matter if it was one child or six. Employee, employee and child rate would be for the same if you had one child or six. Um, same with the family rate. It didn't matter if you had one child or 10 kids. It was all the same rate. Where now 
every single child is uh, rated differently. So if you've got a 20, you know, 25 year old twins or something like that, the kids are eligible up to age 26, as long as they're not disabled. If they're disabled, they can be, you know, I have um, clients with employees who have overage dependence because they may be dependent on their parents due to a, a disability that they have for the rest of their life. And those, those people are also uh, uh, rated up every single year. So, but the standard is up to age 26. And so let's say someone has twin 25 year olds, they're gonna get charged uh, higher than someone that maybe has twin newborns, you know? So uh, it's all dependent on their age and their rate and how many dependents they have. Uh, where before it was just a, like I said, a cumulative uh, rate uh, dependent on their age, of course, with their age bracket. So anyway, that's a lot of different rates for an employer to keep track of. It makes uh, administration and calculating payroll deductions quite tricky for someone, uh, an employer, you know, an administrator within a small group employer that doesn't do insurance all the time. So that's something that we help all of our clients calculate uh, on a regular basis, even if they're hiring and firing every month. They get um, a sheet that breaks that down for themselves and their new hire. And they also have the availability to go online and view all that information. So really, really great to be able to step in and help an employer like this in a situation like this for a financial gain, um, you know, be able to cut costs, improve their cash flow, and also improve some of the administrative burden uh, that they weren't getting before. And something that the financial advisor really pointed out to me, and she actually brought it up in a group setting because um, she was really just so happy, said, I had five other agents look at this. And, you know, this woman, me, um, really came through and looked at absolutely every option for them and was able to find something to save them the money where I don't know what other agents were looking at or if they didn't have the ability to look at it, uh, but I've been able to position my, myself and my team in a way where we are able to look at uh, pretty much everything. Um, I mean, there, there might be something out there that I'm unaware of, you know, maybe just out of ignorance. I mean, I'm not going to say I know every single thing about every single insurance carrier and option, but um, I'm always open to learning more. I'm always talking to vendors. I'm, I've heard other vendors say that we are a lot easier to talk to than some of my competitors. I'm a lot more open to looking at uh, options or different associations and different TPAs and funding strategies where perhaps my competitors just aren't. I'm not really sure exactly why that is, but uh, well, I have some ideas of why that is, but the reason why I think I've been able to consistently do it, I've been in this business for 20 years, and I think the reason why I've been consistently able to do it is because I enjoy learning. I enjoy seeing what else is out there because everybody knows insurance is not perfect and there's lots of problems with our current system and our current healthcare system and I am open to any other anybody that presents any kind of solution any sort of financial relief for employees and my clients if there's um, a strategy or a way of doing things that I'm missing in some way, I want it to be explained to me. I want to know the upsides and the downsides. And of course, when you're talking to a salesperson, they're going to tell you all the upsides. But I know that there's a downside to everything. Not everything is all upside, no downside. Yes, you can have things where it's a win for you, a win for the client, and a win for the employee. But there's always a downside. <laughs> there just is. And a lot of times it's weighing the downsides. Is the downside just the, the extra work making the change? You know, sometimes, it, a lot of times it comes down to that. It comes down to the extra work 
and the disruption to the employees as to why somebody doesn't want to make a change. And I 100% agree. I 100% understand disruption in network and disruption in Sally's child who's sick, can't see the provider that they need to see, or they can, but just having any sort of change does cause a disruption. And even when we have everything aligned. So one of the things we do is uh, an employee survey and ask the, we draft it all up. We make it available online and it's very easy for the employees to put in their information. So in order for us to evaluate what plans and what networks are going to be the best. We need to know who are their dentists, what eye doctors do they need to see or want to see, and what medical providers do they need or want to see. And we only have information if the employee divulges that. Of course, if they have a self-funded plan or the employer is paying the claims in some way, we have more information there. But pretty much privacy legislation and laws prevent insurance companies from giving us, divulging too much information to us as the broker or to the employer. So we don't always know who the employees are seeing and what they're going in for, uh, rightfully so, because employees don't want that information held against them. So we create an anonymous survey. Employees can submit who they need to see so that I can make sure that those providers are in the new network. And even if all of those things are aligned, even if we've done all that work and we make sure that the new option has all of the doctors that are needed and all of the hospitals that the employees have requested, there is still a disruption. There's, they still have to update their insurance information with their providers Oftentimes there's disruption in prescription drugs because when you move from one carrier to another, those carriers are not sharing information. So say you've already gotten a pre-approval for a specialty medication with United Healthcare, then you go over to Blue Cross Blue Shield product. Blue Cross Blue Shield has no idea and does not have any of that information from UHC. UHC is not going to transfer that approval over. So the first time the employee goes in to get the prescription, they go, oh my gosh, it's not covered and they're denying it. And oftentimes it is because Blue Cross Blue Shield needs that doctor's office to resubmit all of the approval information over to that new carrier or sometimes even their PBM, their pharmacy management um, provider because not all plans even use their own, <laughs> their own pharmacy information. Sometimes they farm that out to a company that that's all they do. So I don't wanna to get too in the weeds on that, but my point is that there's always disruption in some way, even if you believe that you've aligned <laughs> all of the things, I always, try to bring reality to the situation when a change does arise. It's not always just as simple as filling out some paperwork. There is, there is going to be some disruption to one of your employees. It's just going to happen and we have to expect that. And we have to communicate that to the employees and let them know, hey, if this comes up or when this happens, this, this is what it looks like and this is what has to be done. Definitely having that those conversations brings the stress level down for the employees in my experience because if they are not aware that there could be a disruption, most people's brains go to the worst case scenario. Oh my God, this isn't covered. Oh my God, I'm going to owe a thousand dollars, you know, because prescription drugs have gotten quite expensive versus if I've, we've already talked about it in, let's say, an open enrollment meeting and the employee remembers, oh yeah, I remember our insurance person telling me that this could happen. So let's reach out to them, like they said in the meeting or in the seminar or in the video that I watched, and reach out to them, let them know this is going on. And I remember them saying that we can do something about it. I don't remember exactly what it is, but you know, they, their brain is more likely to go to a solution than panic mode. 
So, well, so one of our goals is to try to alleviate as much stress as possible for the employees in, in insurance in general. Obviously, we can't control everyone's brains and everyone's behaviors, but I do have some experience in, <laughs> in coaching and I've worked with thousands of employees across my 20 years of being in this business. So I've learned some tricks to help mitigate some of the stress that can arise in the area of insurance. So that's how we work. That's what we do. I'm not going to drone on too much longer and uh, looking forward to working with other clients that are in this sort of situation. I do have a link below if you want to learn more. And thank you for hanging out until the end and I'll see you next time.